Hey, everybody, and welcome to Kerrang's U.S. office in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ethan Vixell, Kerrang's U.S. director, and this is In Conversation with Frank Aero. Yes. You even, you even pronounced my name right. Did I say it right? That's the, like, yeah. Whew. I know. I practiced that shit like 30 times. That was really good. That was really good. Okay, great. Well, Frank, thank you so much for coming here today. Yes. Appreciate no, well, thank it. Thank you for having me. We have a great new album out. Thank you. Barriers. Yes, you're right. So uh, I wanted to start by, by talking about that really quickly, and then we're going to talk about your whole life, okay? We're going to make you cry. Oh, shit. We're going to make you cry. Oh, um, no. Barriers uh, is, is with the Future Violence, your new band. Correct. And um, you've got a, cr a really cool crew there. You've got longtime collaborator Evan Nestor on guitar. Yes, yes, right? that's my brother. Uh, Murder by Death's Matt Armstrong on bass. Uh -huh. uh, the Mermaid's Kaylee Goldsworthy on piano and a bunch of other things. Yeah, she plays violin. Violin. Well, yeah. And then, of course, uh, Thursday's Tucker Rule on drums. Yeah. Very cool. You've actually described that as a dream lineup before. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So how did that come together? Well, I've been working on it for like 20 years. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, met, I met Tucker uh, around probably 99, 2000. Okay. And because... Uh, uh, they were on Eyeball mm -hmm. on Thursday, mm -hmm. and uh, and I signed the Eyeball Records with a band called Pensy Prep, and so around you don't have to clap. <laughs> that was weird. Uh, it's all right though. Um, so we uh, we signed to the label, and they, they would have these label parties, and uh, and I met you know all all the guys from Thursday there, and I was like, oh man, like you know I I, I hadn't really known about the band until I met them. Mm -hmm. And then I got to see them a bunch because you know we we did some some shows together and and also like every time you went to an eyeball party you were gifted whatever records were on on the label at the time it wasn't a great way to for like a business model but like everybody got the records it was kind of nice uh, so I remember listening to uh, to waiting like nonstop that summer and being right. like holy shit like this band's fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, you know, I got to see them and everybody in that band is a fantastic musician. But I remember watching Tucker, uh, especially and being like, you know, this drummer is uh, is somebody that that thinks outside the box. Like he's writing hooks like melodic hooks on drums. Mm -hmm. And uh, and sometimes, you know, when you listen to some of those Thursday songs, like uh, some of the things that you kind of go back to are like these like like, all right, if I were to say like what the the famous singer, right, understanding a car crash, what's the first thing that you think of? Is it? And then it starts, right? It's yeah. It's Tucker. I was going to say it just yeah. Oh, no, yeah. good, yeah. But that's the thing. Like, Tucker has this great uh, just mind for, for music and for melody and, and for hooks. And, uh, and he's also just a really, he's a beast. He's like a, uh, like a really rhythmic player, too. So anyway, I thought, like, would it be awesome to be in a band with him and write songs with him? Yeah. Around the same time, I got to meet Matt uh, Armstrong, because uh, right about, but, but at that time, they were Little Joe Gould. Mm -hmm. They signed to, to Eyeball. And I remember when they came to Jersey and they played a couple of shows at uh, this place called the Loop Lounge. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was like this real little dive bar that we all would play and, and hang out in. Uh, I remember seeing them being like, oh my God, I need to get better. Like <laughs> we all need to get better. Like everything that we're doing, we thought we were really good. And then they came to town and blew everyone's minds. Yeah. So I remember seeing them play, but especially like looking at Matt and being like, you know, you don't have to just follow a guitar line with a bass. Mm -hmm. You know, you can create a soundscape. You can uh, take your own road and, and kind of go against the grain. He was just really creating some amazing, um, amazing melodies and, and 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 again writing hooks mm -hmm. with his instrument. Just the way that he thought about playing bass. Like a lot of times, and I'm not trying to uh, talk down any bass players. In the, are there any bass players in the audience? Oh, uh oh, shit. <laughs> There's a few. Ooh, all right. <laughs> I choose my words wisely. Um, it's rare to find uh, a bass player that's not just a, f a failed guitarist. That's me. <laughs> it, it, just no, I don't cringing right there. No, I'm just yeah. I'm saying, like I'm not saying you're a failed guitar player. <laughs> I'm just saying you have two less strings and fuck you. <laughs> no, I'm, just, yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but I think that's really amazing. You know, like to 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 care about your craft. And Matt cares about his craft. Um, and to the point where sometimes you're like, stop talking about pedals. No, <laughs> but no, he's just amazing. And, and I, again, wanted to be in a band with him, you know, for 20 years. So these two people that, you know, kind of been in the ether and, and, and uh, we've revolved around each other, just never linked up to, to be in a band together. Flash forward uh, to last year uh, or two years ago, I met Kaylee Goldsworthy because we went on tour with Dave Hawes and she was in uh, Dave Hawes' band, The Mermaid. And I remember just seeing her on stage and being like, oh my God, that's another kindred spirit. Like the way that she thinks about music and the way that she can play anything and just she has a beautiful voice. Like that was an amazing like discovery for me to be like, oh my God, there's another one, mm -hmm. you know? Um, 
we got to work together on, on a cover song. Uh, we recorded it at the BBC and we did a cover of R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion. And uh, she played mandolin on that. And it was one of those things that blew my mind. I remember like being in the back lounge and working on this, this song together and just being like, oh, if only we could be doing this with, with stuff that I was writing, you mm -hmm. know, this would really take things to the next level. And so I got really excited and, uh, and I kept her like on my, in, my, in the back of my head. Like if we ever can start a band, that'd be fantastic. Um, Evan, of course, uh, I've known for about 20 years, but I knew him when he was like 15. Um, and I just kind of had to wait till he was of age so I could take him on tour and his mom would let me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, 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 of course married his sister, Jamea, we've been together for, you know, uh, 12 years married, but forever, you know, in my head. Um, <laughs> stop. <laughs> it's nice, but stop. Uh, so anyway, like, uh, when we got together, um, you know, I knew that he was talented, but he was young and I got to watch him grow as a musician, grow as a person and, and just be like, oh man, like this kid really has something. Um, when it came time to start the celebration, mm -hmm. uh, in 2014, he was the first one on my list to like, to start a band with and to, to actually bring on tour. Cause I knew he was like a, he was just like this positive good luck charm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had a conversation with Evan at shows. <laughs> um, it lasts forever, but it's the best thing you've ever, he, cause he could talk about anything and he really cares about what you're speaking about. He's not just waiting for his turn to speak. Uh, he wants to know what, what's on your mind and he cares. Like he's unreal. I've never met such a pure soul in my life. Mm -hmm. Like it's unbelievable. Um, and also that talented, like usually if someone's a really great person, they suck at everything they try. And then you have to be like, Oh, you're okay. That's okay. Right. That's okay. You're good. <laughs> but he's good at everything and he's so amazing. So anyway, I just, uh, I wanted to be on tour with him and i any band that I've, I, I've started throughout this solo career. I wanted them in. Sure. Uh, I never want to be without him. So anyway. Well, yeah, no, it sounds like yeah. you have an amazing team. That's all the uh, time yes, we yes. have today. That, actually, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling us about your man. Well, well I get nervous. I talk. No, no, it's great. <laughs> you you mentioned uh, you know coming from Jersey and, and coming up in that scene. We actually are, are going to be interspersing fan uh, questions tonight with the interview. And oh, we have one about that actually. Really? Okay. Yeah, Cassandra wants to know uh, what was the DIY New Jersey punk scene like when you were growing up, and where can you find it now? Is there one? Um, well, growing up for me. I remember going to see a lot of shows at like VFW halls um, and, uh, it, and, and, you know, just DIY spaces like uh, basements were, were big in, in New Brunswick, but that was kind of a far drive for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I saw a lot of uh, shows at, at VFWs and, and um, you know, Legion halls and, and things of that nature. Um, those were really great. You know, you could, you know, go show up with like, you know, $4 or a can of food and, and a dollar and you'd get mm -hmm. to see shows. There were some venues that were supportive of it. Uh, like the pipeline mm -hmm. um, uh, that didn't last long for me because I think it got shut down like when I was kind of really, really getting into it. But I did get to go to a couple of shows there. Uh, there was Studio 21 in Newark. Um, and uh, and there was a few places like uh, places in Boundbrook and, and things of that nature. But it, I think what was nice about the scene was that it 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 enriched itself. You know, um, the thing about Jersey is it, it's very incestuous in that everyone... <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. Everyone, <laughs> not literally. Yeah, not like yeah, like yeah. <laughs> well, it dep yeah, depends on how how South Jersey you get. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone plays in everybody else's band, you know. Uh, so one person puts on shows and plays in three di different bands. One guy has a PA and plays in three different bands. Another uh, person um, works at Staples and plays right. in three different bands. And I worked at Staples. <laughs> Um, st well, let, let's say, uh, geez, I guess the, just, the statute of limitations is over on that, but I was <laughs> able to, to, oh my gosh, I got so many shows because of how many flyers I could walk out the back door of Staples. Wow. It was crazy. Let's hope your Staples manager is not watching this. <laughs> oh, he, he was in the band. <laughs> was he in the band? <laughs> yeah. So that's how that, that kind of worked. That was really nice. Like we, I mean, you, you, you know, we made magnets. We made everything because we worked in the copy center. Wow. Yeah. Let's, can we scratch that? No, it wasn't Staples. It was <laughs> Naples. And <Got> yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, coming out of the Jersey scene, you, were, you mentioned Pensy Prep. Yes. You played in this band. How many people have heard uh, Pensy Prep before? So you, you got some oh, old wow. school fans here. Very cool. Um, when you were in Pensy Prep, did you ever think at that time that it would land you in one of the biggest rock bands ever? 
when you were playing oh, in that band? No. 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 <laughs> what, what were you thinking while you were playing in that band? What were your aspirations? Um, I think the aspiration was just always to, to just write songs and, and play shows and, and, and just tour. Mm. You know, I just always wanted to be in a band. I wanted to write songs that people would eventually sing along to, mm -hmm. maybe dance at some point. Like, that, that was awesome. Um, I remember the first show I ever had where a pit broke out and I lost my, I was like, <laughs> it was the greatest thing that had yeah. ever happened, you know? Um, it didn't last long, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was, it, it invigorated it. You know, like I, I feel like as an artist, we very rarely, uh, are loved back mm -hmm. by the thing that we invest everything into. You know what I mean? We, we create cause we have to, cause it makes our soul feel good. And because, you know, it's just, it's like breathing. Um, you don't do this because you think you're going to become a rock star or become a famous person. You know, mm -hmm. if you're doing that, then you've already fucked up. Right. Um, because that shit does, doesn't happen, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, I mean, sometimes it does. But, <laughs> but it's not, like, on your radar. It's not right. never on your radar, you know what I mean? So um, that's, yeah, that wasn't ever my, uh, never my intention. Right. I just always thought, like, all right, well, I'll have to work at, like, McDonald's or something, but I'll always be in a band, right. you know? Um, if I can afford strings, I'll be good. Right. And you were the front man of that band. I was, but that was only because nobody else wanted to do it. Okay. <laughs> well, you're front man now. Right. Yeah. And so I was wondering <laughs> when you joined when you joined My Chemical Romance, was it hard to kind of step back from that frontman role and be a more supporting role? Because it seems like no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. No, that was oh, I was always looking for that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, that's the thing. I always wanted to be in a band, and I always wanted to write songs, but yeah. I didn't want to have to necessarily be the one, the face of it. Hmm. You know, I I wanted to be in the background somewhere mm -hmm. and just be able to like you know thrash around the stage and and have a good time. Mm. Um. And so when Mike came around, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> like, just, I could smoke cigarettes and just fucking do this. <laughs> like, that's great. But the irony of that, of course, is that you guys became so famous that you were certainly recognizable anyway. Right, yeah. And yeah. so what, what was that moment when you realized that you were, like, a famous person? At least in our world. Do you remember that feeling of, like, oh, damn. It's, um, we're, in a different, we're in a different time. It's well, not Pensy Prep anymore. <laughs> I don't remember a definitive time in my mind. Mm -hmm. But I do remember... I remember getting a phone call from my grandfather. Okay. That said, and this was like, like we had got, we had, we had gotten a platinum record and like we had been on TV and we had done all these things. And then he called me one day and he was like, oh my God, you're in the Trentonian, which is the local Trenton paper. <laughs> and, and the Trentonian had said like, you know, like famous birthdays and they listed my name and he wow. was like, Frankie, you made it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's amazing. So that, yeah, that that's was amazing. amazing. Well, you had a great run with the band. I'm wondering when it all ended. What was that? 2012. Like? No, no. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but but in 2012. Right. When G note. Ended, right. Oh. Wow. oh. <laughs> Stop. How? Uh, <laughs> what was that feeling like for you? I mean, what were what state were you in when it all uh, went down? You kind of had to part ways. What was that experience for you like personally? I think it was bittersweet. Mm. You know, I think. Um, it was one of those things where it was like, we started it for the right reasons. We mm -hmm. ended it for the right reasons. And it, it felt like that's, that should be it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but at the same time, when you've, when you've dedicated so much of your life, like 12 years, sure. you know, to, to certain things, it starts to end up like defining you. Right. And you're like, oh my God, like, well, what do I do now? Like, who am I? Right. You know? And um, the answer to that is you don't know, you know? Um, and then you find it along the way. And that's kind of amazing. I think that as, as hard of a learning curve as that was, mm -hmm. and, and that will be, I'm sure again, at some point, um, I'm thankful for those, those, mm -hmm. those moments, because it's not about success. It's, 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 it's about, you know, like falling down and getting a scar and getting back up. Like that's what makes you really grow and, and realize things about yourself. Like that's when you really have this opportunity to, to do great, tremendous things. That's the perfect segue into our next crowd question. Oh, okay. I don't know if you're being, you're in cahoots oh, with yeah, Brittany. I, well. Brittany wants to know, what is something you learned in your career as a musician that you never would have otherwise known without experiencing it firsthand? Is oh, there anything, that, any lessons that you feel like you, whether it's through the MyKim years or through even just the last three or four years or five years, what is it that you feel like you took away that you couldn't have known otherwise? Um, well, there's a lot of, I mean, that's, that's a hard one to, to answer. I feel like, you know, like, as far as I, right, so let's break it down. Like as a songwriter, mm. you know, I think starting out, I, uh, 
it, it was nice to, to learn later on, like just because I wrote it doesn't mean it needs to be in the song. Mm -hmm. um, very often as, as musicians or as creators, uh, we can't see the forest for the trees and we, we don't always think about what's best for the song. Like mm -hmm. I think learning uh, to kill your ego, right. ego is a huge deal. Right. Um, Cause you know, as many of you probably know, like you can work tirelessly on something and then ruin it with one foul swoop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's hard. Like self editing is a really tough process. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that's, that's a, that's a difficult thing to like, to, to listen back and be like, Hey, you know, that wasn't very good. This would be better without it or without you. Like, that's a huge thing. Like sometimes the, the loudest thing you could say is a whisper. And sometimes the best thing you can play is nothing at all. Mm. Well, in 2013, you started releasing your solo material. Mm -hmm. That stuff, you couldn't kind of hide behind. I mean, it was you, right? right? Yeah. Joyriding was the first demo, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so with the, that being the first thing with your name on it, how did that feel to have that out there? You're like, here I am. I'm Frank Aiero. I'm here. <laughs> it's not just my camera pensy prep. It's like, this is your name on it. How did that feel? I didn't think about it like that. No? <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't. Because um, here's the thing. I never in a million years was ever like, oh, I can't wait to use this as a springboard to like shine as a solo artist. Like mm -hmm. that was never in my mind. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh no, no one else is here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all alone now. Right. What do I call it? Right. <laughs> so um, it's funny. I, I ended up doing uh, an interview. I, I'm pretty sure it was like a Kerrang interview. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got inspired and I wrote, that song like that night and then decided well if I wait too long I'm never gonna I'm gonna get too scared and I'm not gonna show anybody this so I better just put it up on the internet hmm. and that's what I did and then the response was so um I guess confidence boosting mm -hmm. that I just kept writing songs and recording them and then eventually it turned into stomach aches Interesting. Well, it, it's a great record, Thank but it's you. very different from Barriers. Very right? different, yeah. And I think that the most noticeable difference is that it's, it sounds like it almost like much more tightly wound. Like it's, there's a lot, it's much more compact in some ways. What? Yeah, I think so. I think there, no, no, no. I think that you're right. I, there's a lot in there. Okay. A, it's, it's, it's compressed, like, well, not in the not, form of not like, like yeah. mastering compressed. No, no, no. Like yeah. Compressed no, in terms no. of songwriting yeah. and ter like the emotion. Yeah. And you actually said in a quote to Kerrang, you once said, I feel like you can hear a lot of me trying to hide behind stuff Definitely. about that record. Definitely. What did you mean by that? I think to, to answer that, I have to go back. Okay. Um, I never expected that, that to be a record that anyone heard. Okay. That was just for me. Okay. Um, I, I, I had confidence because the response was nice for, for joyriding. But not like comments like, oh, now I'm going to write a record and release it. It was like, oh, I should keep doing this. And then one day I'll have this record that I made and I can show my kids what I was up to at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but like never did I think like, oh, I can't wait for people to like to hear these songs and these things that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't a thing. And even then I wanted it to be kind of garbled and and disguised. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I wanted you to feel like you were listening in on this record as opposed to listening to it okay you know it was uh it was very much like writing in your diary and then eventually you know like showing it to someone that you love like a, a, you know like writing a letter to your future self kind of thing um but never was it supposed to be a record that was digested by strangers okay ever are you glad that it's out now i am okay. i am but that was a lot like that was that was hard yeah. to do um because i think the the biggest fear that you have as an artist is to be told that you're crazy Mm -hmm. You know, like to, to toil and, and give everything you have to this this project that you believe in and then release it and people be like, this is just scribbles on the wall. Right. Like, what is this? You know, that's a that's a hard thing to 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 relinquish and, and, and take in, like for people to be like, no, you're terrible. Sure. <laughs> well, one of the, the biggest risks I think you took was with death spells, in my opinion. I, that's yeah. an interesting project. It was. Yeah. Um, yeah, nothing above, nothing below was the record. Right, and yeah. this was with uh, James Deweese, who was yes. in um, uh, Get Up Kids, Get Up Kids, Cole uh, S, Cole uh, S, Regin the Full Regin Effect, Effect. Yeah. My Chemical Romance, My chem right? Yeah, and so um, that's sort of like a I don't know digital hardcore. What would you call it? I guess so. Right? Yeah, it was a yeah, it's like a an art project, really. Were you happy with how that came out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it was it was a fun record to make. Yeah, you know, um, 
I like that we worked in both uh, uh, audio and, and, and visual, you know, mm -hmm. and, and for those shows and stuff like that. I think that um, it's, it's hard to release a record that's supposed to be also seen. Right. You know, uh, but I think we did a pretty good job. Sure. With that. What, when you say we, what's your relationship with James like? Because you've collaborated with him so many times before. I think it's it's somebody I look up to that uh, I've just, I mean, he's a genius. Yeah. Like, I, some a lot of people say like, oh, that's, that person's brilliant or that person's a genius. No, right. you, that that's not true. Right. He is a genius though. I, I, I don't use that word lightly. Like, he truly is. Okay. Um, and I mean, I'm not in every aspect. <laughs> 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 but he's but human. creatively, right. he's there, he's unparalleled. I've never seen anybody um, just be able to to just hear something, play it, or or come up with things on the spot that are just so just so eloquent and and, and amazing or brutal when they need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's unlike anyone else I've ever met. So with that said, I I've we became aware of James of course uh with Get Up Kids and and then when Reggie and Full Effect did their first tour I bought a ticket and, and went to see them at CB's nice and I remember seeing him and being like what the fuck is this is crazy like furry suits and yeah, weird yeah, things yeah. And, yeah. and then you know not too long after that maybe I would say four years after that I was on tour with Reggie oh, wow. um where James took it my cam out and we became very fast friends um some of that of course is based in music some of that was based in and the party lifestyle, right? Uh, but uh, you know, you bond really quick uh, yeah. in at, in those days on tour, and uh, and I just it's again kindred spirits. Like I, I've I've look, always looked up to him as as a, a friend and, and as a as a kind soul and as a, a genius musician. Um, he's inspiring and inspired, and he's unbelievable. Will yeah. there ever be any more Death Spells music? I don't know. You, don't know. you know, actually, we we d talked about it because we just did a tour together. Oh, cool. And uh, it was one of those things like, oh, yeah, we're going to have all this extra time. Maybe we'll write a Death Spells record. And we had no time, <laughs> like none. Right. So it didn't happen. But, uh, you know, Death Spells is kind of like one of those projects where sure. it's just like, I never, I have no idea. Sure. <laughs> I have no idea. And you're both sort of on the same page about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in 2016 was probably one of the most intense experiences of your life with the, the bus crash. Right. right yeah. And you've talked to Krang about that a lot. Um, and I don't need to belabor too much, but at, at some point... <laughs> Uh, I just did want to understand one thing because you mentioned that you felt like you weren't sure if you had like died and crossed over into a different world. Right. Um, are you able to talk about that emotional experience at all, or what that meant when you said that to to um, you know one of our writers? Right. Uh, yeah, I'm able to talk about it. I, I don't know if I can make much more sense out of it. Um, it's one of those things that it just poses more questions. Mm. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever fully uh, come to terms with it. Uh, it's just one of those things that I feel like I have to deal with what the, the, the place that I'm at and, and, and the, the cards that I've been dealt, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, whether or not this is real <laughs> or imagined, I have to kind of make the best of it. And I, I did come to this one realization that if I am imagining all of this, right, not, not, <laughs> not to be that self-centered that all of you <laughs> are a figment of my imagination. Dude, we've all done this. I, we've I all mean, had no, no. Here's the thing. Well, Every, consider, yeah. Everyone's life revolves around themselves. It's right. just, that's just the way it goes. Because that's all you see is your <laughs> peripheral. Anyway, um, if I am imagining all of this, then that would mean that I am in control of the things that, that happen and, and the chances that I take. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to be a real asshole to <laughs> imagine myself failing at something I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So that allows me to kind of take, these, uh, take on uh, these challenges. And, and really just, you know, try things that I've always wanted to do because in that respect, then uh, it's going to work out. On hopefully a more positive note, did that at least help you I form? I think that's positive. Don't you think? Yeah, no, no that is. Right. That is. Okay. I meant like, you know, getting away from the core of it. But like, I mean, it also helped you, I, I think, form the future violence, right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, that was, so that that was really the hardest hurdle was to to write a record after all of this shit happened. Right. And, and to have to address that because uh, my my biggest problem was anything that i was writing or anything i was talking about or the way i was saying things wasn't it wasn't encompassing all the 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 emotions and the feelings i had uh about this monumental issue you know uh or action that happened and uh and that sucks because it's like how do you write a record and and not do this thing justice that has ch changed your entire outlook and world um, 
and then again, like, how do you write a record about something that's changed your entire outlook and entire world? Like, right. how do you do that? Because once you write it down, once you release it, then it's defined. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, for the longest time, I just I didn't want to do it. Shh. No. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, for the longest time, I just I was like, maybe I just can't do this anymore. You know, right. like maybe that's just something I did in my past life, and I just don't do this. Um, but then, of course, you know, the, this this band that I wanted to work with for 20 years was free to make a record, and I was like, oh man, like how do I not take that opportunity? Because I can't fucking deal with this. Like that sucks. Mm. I would regret regret that forever. And then, how much am I going to let this this accident take from me? You know, um, it hasn't taken my ability to play fully. So why should I let it? You know. Mm -hmm. But it must have shaped you in some way. I mean, you've already yes. said that. And I think it's also interesting that the bands that you've you've formed, right? You have the celebration, yay! <laughs> the patience. And right. then the future violence. Right, yeah. That's an interesting trajectory. Is there any sort of, like, did you ever think about that? How it, they sort of have evolved? Oh, I've thought about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first time, uh, the celebration was kind of like this, how do I detract from it just being me and me feeling like I am not good enough to be the center of attention? Okay. If I bring a party along, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, people are going to have a good time and, and not pay attention that it's just me up there, like, <laughs> either either not having a good time right. or fumbling through trying to figure out how to do this. Right. Uh, the second was, all right, I feel more comfortable in doing this. I don't need uh, something to detract from from what I'm doing. I want the ability to kind of enjoy it, the uh, ability to kind of take a step back and enjoy that moment. Mm -hmm. So I brought the patience along. <laughs> um, <laughs> the third time, that was just a very serendipitous uh, event because – on the flight to Sydney, um, we were gearing up for the record to drop where we were going to be the patients. And I remember, you know, not we didn't tell anybody what it was. I think I had I had maybe told the band, I definitely told Paul, my mm -hmm. manager, um, but like no one else really knew what the band was called. And we were on the flight and the steward came over and was like, I got you guys look like you're in a band or something. <laughs> and we're like, Yeah. And he was like, Oh, what's the name of the band? And very I was like, oh, it's the first time I get to say it. I was like, oh, it's called Frank Iyer on the Patience. He was like, the future violence. I was like, that's fucking dope. Wow. What is that? So it was a misheard name. It was a misheard name. So I wrote it down because I didn't know what it was. I was like, maybe that's a song title or something. But I started to think about that after the accident happened. And I was like, wow, like what a violent action that caused this ripple effect that like changed everything, mm. you know? And, um, and I started to think about like, yeah, like, Life is a lot like that. Like it's a series of these very violent, abrupt, just instances, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it can be horrible and we can think that these things are happening to us and, and destroying our lives or it could be things that are happening for us. You know, these, these, uh, you know, these violent uh, instances, these, these uh, happenings, right? It's a lot like, and I've said this before, but it's a lot like, you know, staring into a lake and kind of, you could live vicariously through the things that are happening and, and be very passive mm -hmm. or you can pick up a rock and just toss it in and create this ripple effect and mm -hmm. disrupt everything. That's a violent action. I wanted the band and the people that are listening to the record to be affected by it, to be, you know, violently shooken. Is that shaken? shaken. Shook. Shaken. Violently shooken. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> violently shook to the point where it, it inspired them to do the things that scared the shit out of them. Right. You know, because that's what we did to make this record. Uh, we have a, a fan question about okay. the names. Uh, you've mentioned that changing your band's name with each record allows you to reinvent yourself, step out of the expectations of releasing the same material. Do you ever find that limiting, actually, in, in that you're now under the expectation to release something radically different each time? N no. I, I think it's scary. It takes you out of your comfort zone. Because, like, basically... When I had the band figured out, mm -hmm. you know, when I, I've been like, all right, I know what this person's gonna play before they play it. I know how this person's gonna react to like the song that I've written. Um, that's when I change everything. And then right. it's like, oh my God, now what? You know, like now what's going to happen? Um, and that's frightening. You know, like you can never fall into a pattern of feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like that's when the great things start to emerge. Uh, when you bring someone else in, new into the mix and they play things differently and it changes the way that you think about the song that you wrote uh, or, or the way that you're going to write the next song. Um, so yeah, th for me, 
that's just always been about growth and and changing up you know my comfort zone mm -hmm. um yeah that's i feel like i work best when <laughs> work best when i'm uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. i guess yeah it's I, yeah it's weird that's yeah. something that a lot of artists feel i though i think yeah though. yeah so now here we are at, with barriers right you have this album out um and and to go back to the sound a little bit again stomach aches and parachutes were kind of we were saying compressed you know what we mean by that but like more kind of tightly wound right this album honestly sounds like you're in the room with us like we're hanging yeah. out and it's just like up close and personal less raucous and more focused in some ways um uh, but also just as raw and that uh you know album was produced by steve albini Right, right. Nirvana. He would he would tell you he's it, it's he didn't he's not a engineer. Yes, yeah. Right. He's yes. he's sort of more of a hands off type guy, even though he's turning yeah. the knobs. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, which is weird. But you know, uh, for those who don't know, you know, Nirvana, Breeders, Pixies, Pixies yeah. like all these great classic uh, bands, uh, and he's got his own music as well. But bands that are kind of kind of like known for tortured pop music in some ways. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I was wondering how much influence Steve had on the record. If you could talk about that for a second, what he what he did for the record. Well. It was important for me to know who I was making the record with mm -hmm. uh, before writing it. Uh, so I think we set out to to work with Steve and and book the time when I, when we when we figured out what the band was and we started I started to write these songs. I saw that was what was coming out. We immediately uh, contacted Steve and, and saw what his availability was. Uh, we realized that it would work in 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 the time frame. And then I was like, okay, great. Now I know I can write this this Steve Albini record. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, not like aping things that he's done, but I, I, I was lucky enough to, to be able to work with Steve um, for a weekend in 2016, right before we recorded Parachutes with uh, Russ Robinson. And I didn't know what to expect going in, but I found out very, uh, very quickly that uh, I needed to be in, in that, that, the helm. You know, I needed to be in the producer chair. I needed to know what my band should sound like, what this record should sound like better than anyone else. Right. And, and and I was not going to get any input from him on that. Okay. Um, which is scary because if you're not expecting that, like any producer that I've ever, uh, you know, worked with before or anything like that was like a lot of like break you down to build you up and like have all this input and have a hand in things. Um, and Steve is very anti that. He wants to capture your band the way that your band sounds on your gear mm -hmm. and and not have any kind of influence on the the way that it sounds. Uh, he feels like it would be an injustice to color the, the sound of your band because it's not his record, it's your record. Hmm. And that's a really wonderful way to think about things, but if you're not used to it, it's terrifying, right? Right, a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure, yeah. yeah. Uh, especially with being uh, an artist at that point coming right off of Stomach Aches where I kind of stumbled my way through makeshifting my own record and then being like i don't know if i know how to write a record because i didn't s actually set out to write a record and then went right into steve and steve was like all right what are we doing and i was like oh well what do you think about this he's like i don't know what do you think about this and i was like oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> so i ended up writing you know parachutes and working with with ross and, and that was a wonderful experience because ross taught me a lot of wonderful things about uh myself as an as an artist myself as a songwriter and he was the exact opposite of every other producer in that he didn't break me down to build me up. He just built me up from where I was. He, he really does get involved and, and, and help you uh, dig out like what it is that you're saying and why you're saying it the way you're saying it and, and how it should sound to, to really get that point across. He taught me a lot mm. about songwriting and about making records. Um, so I had that knowledge going into this, to this writing process. And I knew that this record, uh, above all else, needed to be from my point of view solely and, and to work with Steve because I wanted Steve to capture this band. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about this record too is that it's the first time that I've had a full band in the room playing um, live. We, we recorded every song, we recorded 17 songs wow. in 15 days, uh, recorded live to tape all in the room and then and mixed it in those 15 days as well. Wow. Like it was breakneck speed. That's crazy. And, uh, and I think it gave this record such a different feel than anything else I'd ever done because you're reacting from somebody that's right across from you. Like the way that they're playing something is going to make you play differently. And mm -hmm. you're, you know, the, the microphones are bleeding into one another and it just, it's an organic feel. And, uh, and yeah, it was a wonderful experience. It was a stressful experience. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to be able to finish it. Really? Um, why is that? Cause I didn't think I had enough time, hmm. you know? Um, 
I think when we we walked in the first day, Steve was like, "All right, so like, what's the plan? Like, how many songs we got?" I was like, "Well, I have 17 songs." He's like, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Well, we'll see what happens." Yeah. And we got to it. We did it. Uh, uh, 14 are on the record. Mm -hmm. And um, in the last three, I just uh, I just didn't feel right to be clear. I usually think of a record as 12 songs. Mm. This is the first time I've, we've done 14, and it ended up being a double record. And it's like the first time I've ever done that. Huh? Yeah. Well, I'm a little disappointed that he didn't like scream in your face or do something no, crazy to get no. to it. But I'm excited that you know we really know we're getting like the pure Frank experience on this record. Yeah, um, it seems and it feels that way. Uh, lots of different songs on here that are great. Um, I think "Ode to Destruction" have especially like raw vocals where you kind of feels like you're really getting something special from you. And we have a question about another song from Michelle, who I think is here tonight. Uh, Okay. Uh, she wants to know, uh, Police Police has a very important message about some of the things going on in today's world. Yes. Uh, what inspired that song? Um, I think True Life inspired that song. You know, um, I think it's it's scary to me and, and upsetting to me that um, <laughs> that that human rights and, and the idea of, of loving one another and, and, and helping each other and, and living uh, in, in the same world like with respect for mm -hmm. one another is a political statement. Like that's mm -hmm. fucked up to me. Um, I think that should just be a no brainer that we should look out for one another and, and help one another without trying to break each other down. Um, I think that love is a wonderful thing and um, you should be able to live your life if you're not hurting someone else uh, the way that you want to live your life and people mm -hmm. should uh, support you in that mm -hmm. uh, and not, you know, try to, destroy you because of the color of your skin or the you know your sexual preference or or your religious religious beliefs so sure yeah. and and the the name of the record is barriers correct right and so barriers uh, it sounds like has to do with building walls and sort of breaking them down right um you're reading your interviews and your twitter feed and your lyrics it seems like you're an open book in some respects i think so yeah i think so do you I, I, so you do perceive yourself that way I do. Okay. Yeah. I don't ha think I had very much. I, if, if, if I'm trying to, it's, I don't do it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So have you always been that way or is this something that you've evolved into or do you feel like you were like that from, you know, the time you were a kid? I don't know. Like a bad liar, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Just sort of uh, very open about your emotions and sort of, I don't know, wearing your heart on your sleeve, so to speak. No, I think I've always been that. I've always been very uh, sensitive and, and uh, I think about things. A lot. I think mm -hmm. about. I overthink about things a lot. Okay. Uh, I stay up at night thinking about things that happened that day and the way that um, I I I act or the way that other people acted to me and how that makes me feel. Mm -hmm. Much to my wife's chagrin, because she is not like that. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the one that's like, do you want to talk about? Do you want? <laughs> do you want to talk about that thing that happened? And she's like, no. <laughs> why would Why would we talk about the thing that happened? Yeah, I I need to like I I, I think about everything. Do you perseverate? You kind of think about things over and over and over and over, yes. and over again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's yeah. something that has been bothering you lately? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is welcome to therapy. Uh, let's talk about music for a second. If there is one song that you could play for the rest of your life, or that you had to play for the rest of your life that you've written, that ever? Oh, that I've written. Yeah. Okay. No, not somebody uh, else's song. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. like that new Beatles so movie many, where yeah. the guy writes yeah. all the Beatles. Um, uh, yeah. This is this question from Elizabeth, who's here today. Um, if you could only play one song that you've made for the rest of your life, what would it be? I mean, best friends forever. I think. Yeah. Cool. Aww. <laughs> you just knew what the reaction yeah. would be. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's true though. I, why, like, why is that? Um, it's just special. It's really special to me. Um, you know, it's a song that. It started with, uh, you know, my, my daughters mm -hmm. uh, singing to an, each other to like kind of like make each other mad. And we turned it <laughs> into something that was really great. And uh, and they were young, like when this all started, like mm -hmm. it's it's so amazing to me. Like, like first off, like I'm amazed that I'm this lucky that I get to be like their dad. Like that blows my mind. I don't I get to be around them and see like the people that they are and, and experience that from like from day zero mm -hmm. till however long I'll be around, like that is amazing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and I got to see like this inherent weirdness, like the inherent weirdness is the best part of human beings. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys know that, but like there's a moment or hopefully it lasts longer than a moment, but like it, it's a very short window where they don't learn to be weird from anyone else. It's just them, like it's just this weird, <laughs> like 
pure soul of strangeness. It's so bizarre. And it's it to see that dissipate, to see that go is so heartbreaking. Cause like, you know, eventually they're going to do something in school and someone's going to be like, you're fucking weird. And they're gonna be like, Oh shit, I should never do that again. But you hope that it lasts forever because it makes it, it makes the world such a brighter place. Uh, they've always been creative. Uh, my, my daughter, Lily, like she, she, she makes friends and she like wants to like, like she built a teddy bear and a, like a fucking basket for like this one little girl that she just met one day because she thought she needed a teddy bear. And I was like, what, who are you? Yeah. Like, what the, f this is crazy. So like, they're, they're just, they're just amazing uh, young people. And we were able to make this song together and I play it every show we, we sound, that's the first song we sound check with. Oh yeah. Uh, even if it's not in the set, we, I, I have to play it. It's like a good luck charm. That's great. So it's like having them around. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I have a two-year-old at home, so I, oh, nice. you can also foster a little bit of the weirdness too. You yeah, can, yeah, you, you try, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, you know, this album, like other albums, you've said is the last time you'll ever make, right? I know. You keep saying it. I know. Do you mean it this time? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, it's weird. Like, as much as I can't imagine uh, writing another record and mm. going through that again, and like you know depleting because it, it, it is as enriching as it is it's very depleting as well mm -hmm. as much as i can't imagine doing that again i also can't imagine not doing it again right you know so okay well if it is your last album right fans would be very disappointed i would assume okay um they are <laughs> oh, particularly passionate and uh proof here uh we have a, another fan question from cassidy do you ever get overwhelmed with the fact that your music has had such an impact on your fans lives and if so how do you uh deal with it I feel very fortunate to be able to to do what I love and that people appreciate it. Like mm -hmm. that's crazy. That was never in the car. I didn't think that that was ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I still to this day, even that people like even you guys all showed up. I still like showed up like part the car I was like might not be anybody there. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like you yeah. I always think that like you know like gonna play this show. There's gonna be nobody there. No one's gonna say nobody cares. <laughs> like you don't. I don't know if that ever crosses my mind mm -hmm. that. People like <laughs> people like me. It's weird. You know what I mean? Like that. I think that's a Jersey thing, though, too. Like, is that right? Like, you never think that you're like people like you. Like, if you said that people like you, you'd be a real asshole, right? Like <laughs> the one that, like, yeah, right. Whereas you know? New Yorkers just assume everyone likes them. Well, I don't know. I think also, eh, I don't know. I think as a New Yorker, you're like, I don't care if anybody likes me because I don't like anybody else either. That's what it is, right? What's that? Well, North versus US. South Jersey. Central Jersey, they, well, they, they think people should like them. Yes. Yeah. Here's the thing I've re realized about Jersey. This is why <laughs> This is why a lot of New Jersey is lonely and or, or alone is because... Wait, wait, no, listen, listen, <laughs> hear me out, hear me out. It's a good way to end. Uh, wait, no. is it, wait no, just it's, alienate everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's because we're taught that, that you're not, like you shouldn't be proud or, or, or like people don't like you and if someone does like you, you're like oh what's wrong with that fucking asshole <laughs> yeah. that's true i can't like them there's something really wrong with them because they like me that's like funny. that's the thing is that it's a right am i wrong all right yeah yeah okay i'm just saying well we're, we're gonna wrap up here but you know uh <laughs> don't let that be the last no, no, thing no, i no. say i got i got i got two questions for you two questions for you okay. and it's about leaving jersey touring for a okay. second okay um you actually just got back from the uk right i did yeah and before that russia Yes. Okay. And you're going to be touring more? Yes. Okay. So you're on the road. You're not only in Jersey all the time. You no. explore other cultures. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, going back to your, you know, you have your family. You mentioned your, your girls, your twins. Um, mm -hmm. You also have a son that you had yeah. in 2012. Yeah. Um, is the stress now of being away uh, different as a solo artist than when you were touring with the band, with My Chem? Um, well, yeah. I guess so. Because, well, at least with My Chem, there was, uh, you know, more resources there was, yeah, there was more money there <laughs> like so like yeah like <laughs> if you wanted to like have have more room and shit like that like mm -hmm. like you know it's hard to have 30 people in the backstage room at asbury lanes <laughs> like, you know what I mean? that's rough <laughs> yeah. but but at like yeah msg like that's cool you could have a room like so yeah there's certain choices there but as far as like you know the being away thing like that's just always hard yeah um yeah, uh, it never gets easy. And I feel like uh, now, though, too, it's like 
when when they were really young, out of sight, out of mind was a little bit easier. Sure. Uh, for them, now they they know that you're gone. They miss you. Like, right. And, and and it's weird because it's like you're like, well, like you know, so and so's dad doesn't go on tour. It's like, yeah, well, so and so's dad sucks. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I think like if I had a nine to five, right, and I say I worked in the city, and I had to commute every time. Like I'd probably see him for like maybe an hour in the morning, maybe an hour at night, and then they go to bed. Like, but when I'm home from tour, I, I'm home. Right. You know. Unless Paul makes me do interviews, Paul. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> well, let's uh, <laughs> let's close with another fan question. Okay. A, a lovely question, um, which sort of has to do with with touring. And let's say you come home from a stressful day. This is from Emily. Come home from a stressful day. Emily's right here. Uh, oh. When you're finally home or alone at night, what's your go-to comfort food recipe? Oh. <laughs> um, it's gonna be something so Jersey. Watch. <laughs> you think so? I don't know. I don't know. Go I'm finally home from from tour. Yes. All right. Actually, this is funny. These are the types of things that Tucker asks all of us. Okay. Right. He's like, all right, you just get home. Right. <laughs> what do you put in your mouth? <laughs> like, like, what? Does he phrase it like yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then you're like, uh, a bagel. He's like, what does your face look like when you do it? It's like real weird. It's yeah. It's really funny. Um, but yeah, like bagels are huge. I think that's that's the go-to. I think a bagel sandwich would be fucking fantastic at all times. And then pizza, because when pizza's on a bagel, you can eat pizza anytime. Wow, I've heard that before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, I really like Thai food. So I think Thai is my go-to. Can you cook Thai, or do you have to order in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. Frank, uh, I, on behalf of me and all the fans here, we really want to thank you for coming in today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Can we have Frank Aero, a round of applause, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, dude. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you guys.